young Countyans browse in the quiet space of what we believe to be reality. But there is another side. Journey to the Great Beyond. Unlock the secrets of your local library. This is the Beyond the Shelves podcast with your librarians, Jennifer and Lee. Hi, Lee. Hi, Jennifer. This is, well, it's not our new podcast. It's our refurbished re- refurbished podcast. So tell folks what are some of the ways that Beyond the Shelves is going to be different now. Okay. So it used to be a much longer format. We are right. now splitting it up into two a month, hopefully. Because we love you guys and we don't want to hook you in for a whole hour plus. And so we're going to keep it down to, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Snack-sized. Yeah. Fun-sized. And we're going to alternate. We're going to do interviews and book talks. And we're always going to have everyone's favorite, the whiteboard. The whiteboard! Well, speaking of the whiteboard, Lee. Yes. What is on the whiteboard? It is, what do you think about snow? And I've got my top 10, but I do have some honorable mentions at the top. Let's hear those. So lots of simple, love it, and it's beautiful or gorgeous, but cold. And Sawyer, Callie, and Madeline were all very positive about snow, enough to sign their name to it. Shout out to Sawyer, Callie, and Madeline. Yes. I love, I love that ownership. That's very cool. They take Usu- that right there. Yeah, just- usually whiteboard responses are anonymous, so, so I, I love the energy for Sawyer, Callie, and Madeline. Yes. Uh, number 10. I think this speaks for a lot of people. It's pretty as long as I don't have to go to work. Truly. Yeah. Number nine, I heart it inside a snow globe with a snowflake outside of the snow globe. It was an entire piece. That's very poetic. Yes. Yeah. Eight, I'd rather eat food. I, mean, I same. Yeah. Also would rather eat food than snow. Seven, we had not one but two Peppa Pigs saying it's great and it's fun the latter is signed by scarlet so shout out to scarlet another, as well another one we went through a phase on the whiteboard where there was almost always a peppa pig portrait yeah added, so i'm glad that two two peppas two peppas it's a two peppa question yes number six love of fresh snow on trees and hills this question really brought out the poetry it really did it's so pretty number five it was fun for a hour. <laughs> I mean, that is so true. Yeah, <laughs> also, yeah. I I have reached a stage in my life where I mostly like to look at it <laughs> for for an hour. Number four, I like it! Exclamation point. Except when it makes so roads are closed. So like, like I feel like this is a little bit of wanting to have it both ways though. Yeah, you yeah, you I want mean, the snow, but you also yeah. some sort of like only on the grass snow. Maybe. I don't think that works. All right. Number three. I sometimes like it. I love it when school is closed. Amen to that. Amen Truly to what that. they're after is not the, yeah. uh, not the snow, but the school closure. Yeah. Listen, there's a, there's a chance that was written by a teacher <laughs> for real. I'm not just a kid. You know, <laughs> and I think about this all the time. When I was in school, we would do the whole spoon in the pillowcase, flush an ice cube down the yeah, toilet, and wear uh, your pajamas inside wear your, out. Wear your pajamas inside out. Um, that was the whole white ritual. Crayon, white crayon on the windowsill. Yes. Yeah, flushing, yes. The, flushing the ice cubes. Uh, I taught my children to do that. Yeah, very we're, important. We're very pro school closing. Yes. In my family. <laughs> okay, number two, it's kind of the opposite. And this is written in all caps. Giant no, with a frowny face and a speech bubble saying, me mad. <laughs> Again, just don't like it is strong not enough. Strong feelings about Don't like snow. it is not enough. Yeah, very strong feelings. Very strong. It, I, I disagree with these feelings, yeah. but I admire, I admire the level of commitment. The strength. Yeah, for sure. And number one, it's perfect to suntan. Sure. Uh, you I know, guess. it's a decision. You're allowed to do that if you'd like. I mean, I'm not going to stop you. Yes. <laughs> Fine. So our first interview of the reimagined, reborn Beyond the Shelves podcast, I am delighted as someone I have actually bugged a little bit before, so I'm really happy that she finally wore down, is reference librarian Brennan LaCroix. Brennan, we're delighted to talk to you. Yay! And Thank specifically, you. we're going to talk to you about the book that you wrote called Maryville 1920. 
So give us just a little blurb, like what's the elevator speech about this book? Okay, this book is about Maryville, primarily the downtown area as it was 100 years ago. A little bit about the buildings, the people, the institutions, just what was happening 100 years ago. And tell us how the book came about, because I think it's a really interesting origin story. Yeah, what made you choose 1920? Okay, in um, 2019, uh, we had several things going on at the library that got me into researching 1919. So there was a project called Off the Map that the library and several educators and local historians and genealogists worked with high school students on the buildings around town, what was here then, what's still here, and the library helped them research, helped them see what we have in our archives, our files, our books, maps, pictures, and then the library's centennial was coming up in October 2019, so the reference librarians provided background research for that. We put little blurbs in the paper about what was happening 100 years ago with the library, and after the centennial was done, sort of in honor of that, we, as a continuation of that celebration, we had a literary festival honoring the literary heritage of Cormac McCarthy, who once lived in Blount County. And for that event, I planned a walking tour of downtown Maryville as it was in 1919. So I researched a lot of the buildings and conducted a tour. It was such great fun. I have done local history for, I guess, the 10 years that I've worked as a reference librarian, but this was the first time I had concentrated on one particular year, and I started to see a lot of connections. Concurrent with that, I had worked with the library's writer-in-residence, Jim Stovall, on a number of publishing projects over the last three or four years, and he suggested that I write a book on Maribel 1920, which I had never imagined myself writing a book in my wildest dreams, but it sounded like a good idea, and I enjoyed the research, so I was off and running. So is there a new project coming up, like a new book? Yes, I have started a research for a book on Mirabel as it was during World War II. Not going to deal with any military history or anything like that, but just what was happening on the home front, rationing, and just some of the things that were unique to that time. Sure. That is super um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so, very cool. I'm, I'll, I will look forward to that one as well. Yes. The, now, the first book, we had a sustained period of working from home, which really helped me. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm not looking. To, I, I don't think that's on the horizon right now. So, so this might be I'm a little sure bit of a longer process. It might be a longer process. That's okay. We'll, yeah. we, 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 you know, we'll, we'll have you back when it happens. One of the things I really like about the Maryville 1920 book is that it doesn't really have a narrative structure. It's anecdotal, but there is kind of a narrative. You know what I mean? There's, I don't know, a subtextual narrative. And mm -hmm. so I was, you know, I was, as I was reading it, and full disclosure, I and I think Lee are Blount County natives. Yes. So I'm, you know, I'm reading about things and places that are underneath or used to be places that I've been my whole life. And right. so it was really interesting. But I was doing that, that dot connecting. And that's the thing that was so interesting. It's just really fertile. There were characters that stood out for me, like the gentleman who had the two women at his funeral, <laughs> um, who both claimed that he was going to marry them. Or I don't know, just all sorts of little snippets and anecdotes, right. even though it is not a narrative as such. There right. is narrative there, and I just that's one of the things I most enjoyed about it. Thanks. Well, I wonder what you most enjoyed about either the book or things that you uncovered or, or the process. It has enriched my appreciation of local people and places. I'm not a Blunt County native. I'm married a Blunt County native, and I have lived here since 1985 and really was not interested in local history until I started working at the library. If you were to look at the live back of the library, where we are now, as it was 100 years ago, Here's what you would have seen. You would have seen a flour mill, a coal company, the jail, a <laughs> bank, a railroad station, a hotel, a livery stable, several churches, stores, and houses. So that's just from where we sit right now, looking out across the Greenbelt Pond. Those are the things you would have seen. So when I drive through downtown now, I think of what was there before. For instance, the library got its start in the upstairs of what's now Bracken's Blues Club. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great to think yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, so you're in Bracken's Blues Club and you're having a burger and a beer and it used to be a barber shop and I think an optician that were located in the downstairs and the library took two rooms that had been vacated by a law practice. 
I think those connections sort of enrich your appreciation of, of what's there now. It's so hard to imagine with how big our library is, imagining it in the, just that little space. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. those kind of things are really fascinating. Yeah. You mentioned some of the visuals that are in the book. That's some of my favorites. And when I, when I was back in reference, my favorite materials were the old newspapers and the old yearbooks. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of accidental history like they're not doing they're not that. writing it for history they're not writing it for history and so you get so some of the things i love most in the book are things like the newspaper ads right and the the snapshots that show people just going about their day right there are a couple of street scenes you know and i think there was one where there were a bunch of gentlemen posing in front of the business and just seeing what they wore in front and, of the undertaker unintentional yeah. time capsules i think are the best ones yeah because right. they really show you the truth of the matter which sure is that this is people our daily back then aren't really that different than how we are now going into it intentionally writing it for historical purposes it's very different than you know just post an article in the newspaper right. or this you're is, taking a snapshot of the street yeah this is just our yeah. this is our business yep this is what we have on sale and i love pulling all that together as a snapshot of one specific year is just really cool. Yeah. It's it's such a vibrant little peak and digs deep into that into that year. And right in 1920, you would have gotten a dining table and a casket at the same store. <laughs> I mean, sure. One, they're both wood. They're both wood. Exactly. <laughs> of course. Exactly. Yeah. I enjoyed that you really worked. I think, and knowing you, I'm sure this was a deliberate choice to to really cover some of the diversity of the community. So mm -hmm. you get some of the African-American churches and things that were downtown. That was something I especially appreciated as I was reading it in the summer of 2020, mm -hmm. which was a year <laughs> where those issues were very much right. on our minds. Right. So I was yeah. glad that you showed a fuller picture of that year than I think most people who like, like Lee and I, who are white, tend to know about or be exposed to. One story that really interested me so much was um, Second Presbyterian Church which was located right where the parking lot is next to Dandelions right now. So when, Another former library building. Uh, right. <laughs> Dandelions was, was a library, and when when that was built in, what, 1931, was Something it? Something like that, yeah. Uh, Second Presbyterian Church would have been smack dab next to it, and it was an African-American Presbyterian group. They had originally been part of New Providence, and before the Civil War, New Providence had probably 10% of its membership were, were black. So after the Civil War, not as a splinter group, but as a matter of pride, they started their own congregation and they started just next to where they ended up in an old Miraville College dorm building because Miraville College had been downtown. They worshiped there and then in the 1880s, they had enough money to build this white frame building that was ended up next to the Harper Library. Their pastor was a man who had been brought in to develop schools for the black people in Alcoa. But it just, I was just fascinated, and that I had never heard of them. Right. Yeah, Washington. a lot of that history has been lost or erased right. for, for, the, for, for white communities. They, that, uh, that's something that I'm really impressed about with the book, is that there is so much information. There was enough information available just about 1920 right. to right. make a whole book. Right. Well, not a lot of people besides Brennan could have found all that. That is absolutely <laughs> true. Well, it's sort of a perverse persistence that I have. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sorry, we interrupted you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to tell, finish the story about the church. They worshipped in that building until the 1940s when they no longer allowed frame buildings in downtown. The book also has a lot of original artwork. We mm -hmm. had some pictures that maybe weren't very clear or we had maybe, you know, kind of a side view of it and then a back view, but not really like a really good photograph. So Jim Stovall, the writer in residence, is also an artist. So he did a lot of original sketches yeah. of several of the churches some of the other things that we didn't have pictures of. So that makes it truly unique. That's um, one, I was remembering one, and I think it was a picture of, I don't know if it was Second Presbyterian, but one of the, uh, an African-American church community, I remember there was a really neat picture of all the folks, kind of, as if they were coming into church of a morning right. or coming out, and it's really right. cool. So the blend of the photographs and, like you mentioned, the maps and the ads with the original art, is, it really just helps bring it all to life, I think. Creates a cohesive picture. Right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I had not really thought about this until I was had the book in hand, but not being a Blount County native, I don't have any stories of my own here, but I, I have a section on health and medicine, and Dr. William Lovingood was the county health officer that year, and Dr. Granville Dexter LaCroix was Blount County native. He'd just come back from uh, World War One, 
and he had been doctoring in Granger County. While he was away, his wife had moved the family back to what she thought of as civilization here in Maryville. <laughs> and so he, when he got back, he set up his practice there, just down the street from Dr. Lovingood. Well, Dr. Lovingood's granddaughter was my college roommate, and Dr. LeClaire was my husband's grandfather. So, <laughs> so you found your I own family history, your own I personal would not history, be here without knowing the loving goods. That's Isn't wonderful. That funny? How fun! Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to ask because I think one of the most fascinating sections, and I believe I'm remembering right, it's right at the end, is you list the people who died in the year 1920. I didn't list all. Well, mo most of them. Is I, I listed. I tried to do sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right, it was so, a real cross-section. I did, I there tried were to do some prominent were, folks, mm -hmm. and there were penniless mm -hmm. folks, right. and there were you know different races and ethnicities of people. There was a Latino family, and mm -hmm. just a really fascinating little cross-section. And I just was curious why you chose to put that in there, because I personally found that wonderfully interesting. Well, I just, I being a reference librarian, I go for vital records, sure. you know, what, what's documented. Sure. And we have a really good collection of death certificates, oh. pretty much for up to the mid-60s, which I think legally is probably all we can have right now. So I just, I just leafed through it to see who had died. Of course, some of them I had seen in the newspaper, like Miss Charles Alexander, who no longer lived in Maryville, but was very prominent worldwide as an evangelistic song leader. And I thought, well, I'm just going to kind of see what does it look like? You know, was the flu still here? But there were a lot of people dying of contagious diseases, a lot of children. There was whooping cough. There was measles. Right. There was flu. This young woman who was a freshman at Maryville College died. There was a Mexican man who had come here to work for um, the aluminum company, mm -hmm. died of typhoid. There's a, a woman who was murdered. I couldn't find any detail about her. And I thought, you know, people need their stories told, even if it's just sure. a partial story or just the story yeah. that maybe they were forgotten. Yeah, I love that. Well, I want you to plug now. Tell us where a person, now a person could buy this book here in the library, right? Yes. It's, it's, it's published by the Friends of the Library. Right. All proceeds, whether you buy here or through Amazon, go to Friends of the Library, which fund our programs, every mm -hmm. program that we do. The regular paperback is $20. The large print edition is 25 And through Barnes & Noble, or here in the library, we have a hardback edition, which is $30. And I, like I mentioned before we started recording, I have bought, I think, four copies for myself and to give as gifts and all that. So it's Thank you. highly recommended. <laughs> yeah, highly recommended. Thank I, for so one, much. am eager for the next Brennan LaCroix authorship project. Thank you. Jennifer. What, Lee? What's on the whiteboard? Question is, what is your favorite thing about Blunt County? Number 10, it isn't Florida. Oh, burn. Entirely fair, also. Six burn. They have like flying cockroaches in Florida. Yeah. Florida is no, very frightening. That's a sick burn. Florida is the Australia <laughs> of the United States. Number nine, you know, this is a family podcast, but um, <laughs> the number nine answer. It's really interesting with the whiteboard because you can tell by the placement. Again, we're not a visual. Who medium. wrote it? Yes. Who wrote it? And so some of the answers are very high up, and some of them are, you know, down. And so obviously the adults tend to write the high questions. These were not that high up. These were kind of in the middle of the board. So, uh, but there were, someone wrote how hot the guys are. And so this is a tie because someone else wrote hot chicks. And what I want to know, first of all, thank you very much. We understand you're probably talking about us. Appreciative, yes. We love it. Um, the other thing I want to know is, I feel like maybe one of those got written first. And the other one is like a callback, you know, yeah. like, a, like a response. Like, yeah, but it's not just the hot guy. Yeah. yeah I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right. Number eight, the mountain views. Sure. Also mm -hmm. accurate. Right off the brochure. Yes. Number seven, I feel like this is a little bit of a low bar, but I'll, I'll admit it. Number seven, it has air. Well, that is accurate. If nothing else. I mean, think about how awful it would be if it didn't. I think that's maybe to approach it more positively. We are a step above Mars, so. Yeah, right, exactly. Blunt County, better than Mars. That's our new slogan. We really need to get that into the mayor's office. <laughs> I'll put in a call. All right, number six. Those sweet librarians. Oh, this one really is talking about yes, us. That was really nice. <laughs> that's sweet.
Number five, this was actually a very long answer, so I will admit this is a little bit edited, um, but this is how it began. Progressive history during the Civil War, Quakerism, etc. And then they went on to give a few other examples. I thought that was very interesting because they're thinking of people who are listening may not know that Blount County was a stop on the Underground Railroad thanks to the, the Quaker uh, communities that uh, had founded the town of Friendsville here in the county. And there were some other... Uh, most people in Blount County were against slavery, although we, yeah. you know, for I, the I, union. I, would, I don't yeah. know. I think progressive is a little bit of a stretch, but certainly, uh, you know, yeah. a little bit of a. There's some positive stuff there that we may not always remember. Yeah. All right. Uh, number four. Everything but the crimes. <laughs> I don't. I feel like there's not a lot of crimes here, but no. I. Uh, everything but the crimes is a pretty good answer yeah, I, I would say I, I that's a lot there's a lot of things besides crimes yes so, I mean I guess I guess so again, much besides crimes to appreciate th- maybe that's another possible slogan that we can call the tourist board of the mayor yeah Blunt County so much more than crime yes very good <laughs> I'm sure the mayor will appreciate our input <laughs> number three is another really sweet one and a lot of people wrote this this was on there like four times or, or so and it's just simply friends Aww. Isn't that great? That's really sweet. Yeah. I feel like that's probably why I came back. The listeners may not know, but for a long time I lived, you know, more towards the northeastern tip of Tennessee, and I came right. back because, you know, friends and family. Friends brought you back yeah. from the Mountain Empire. Yeah. Um, okay, number two, the library. Yay. Also about us. Yay. I, we hear it all the time. I mean, well, not so much now because there's not that many people in the library, which is very safe behavior. But as we record this in January of 2021, but we hear that a lot, that there are people who actually move here. They're trying to decide, you know, they're retiring or moving and they're trying to decide which specific community to live in. And they'll say uh, the library helped them decide that. So. We have a really solid library. Yeah. So number one. And I'm not just saying that as an employee oh, right. either. No, it, is, yeah. it is very good. We're very, yeah. We are very proud of it. I loved the library long before I got this job. Oh, same. Absolutely same. All right. So number one, this is one of my favorite answers on any whiteboard ever of all time. I think this is fantastic. The number one answer to the question, what is your favorite thing about Blunt County? Books and unicorns. Amazing. Okay. So here's the thing. Whoever wrote this. You can't just be advertising that we have the unicorns, okay? Yeah. We're the only place that has them. It's a secret. I think the secret's out, Nelly. The secret's out. Let's go back to the air and the lack of crimes. <laughs> forget we said forget we said anything about unicorns. We said nothing about unicorns. We definitely Ix. have air if that's what you're asking. If you're looking for air, we have we have air. Ixne on the unicorns, eh? <laughs> We hope you enjoyed the Beyond the Shelves podcast, a production of the Blount County Public Library. To support our show, please subscribe and tell your friends. You can download more episodes at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Ghana, Player FM, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, Audible, and at our website, beyondtheshelves.libsyn.com. This podcast is funded by the Blount County Friends of the Library. Thanks, friends! The library is always there, waiting. Until next time, celebrate history, create connections, inspire imagination.